Welcome to Jeremiah chapter 18, the potter's house. My name is Nolan Winholtz and I'm the potter. Uh, many years before the time Jesus came onto the earth, uh, the Lord God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and said, go down to the potter's house. There I'm going to give you my message. So what we're doing here today is we're bringing the potter's house to you. I've been a potter for over 30 years and I've been a missionary and a minister for over 30 years as well. And this is the potter's house. Thank you for joining us. Joining with me today is my very good friend, Becky Rowland. I've done many trips over to Russia and Ukraine, but Becky began to work over in Eastern Europe 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Was it 20 years ago, Becky? Mm -hmm. Everybody, we want to welcome Becky Rowland to the show today. Thank you. All right. Becky, it's great to have you here at the Potter's House. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here today. Yeah, this is where I make pottery and I produce stuff. I sell it all over the world. but. This is where people come and, and um, see the potter work and talk about the things that God has done in their life. Well, I have seen your beautiful pots, and I am excited today to see you actually make pot. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be making pottery here. So, Becky, glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a few vessels while we're talking, but I want you to talk to the people that are listening today about, number one, how did you get to Eastern Europe? You started out in Belarus, right? Yeah, I went on a short-term mission trip, first of all, with my local church okay. um, many years ago. I was in my somewhere 20s, okay. and the Soviet Union had just collapsed okay. in the early 90s, and that's when I went on my first short-term mission trip, thinking it was the only opportunity to go. Okay. And then uh, so after... There, there was a sense of urgency. There was a sense of urgency, and... You know, it was it was pretty amazing that we as Americans had always understood that the Soviet Union was our enemy, mm -hmm. and now the the whole system had collapsed, and we had an opportunity to go in and take Bibles and Excellent. take humanitarian aid. Awesome, and, and we didn't know what was going to be the result of that, but God touched my heart. That's wonderful. Can I interject a story myself that's very uh, relates directly to this? Yeah. I first went to Moscow and to Russia back in '95, and I remember when I arrived. When I arrived at the Moscow office for the missionary organization I was working with, I had only brought a little bit of clay with me. See, I was bringing a potter's wheel with me, and I was traveling all over Russia, talking about how we were claying God as a potter. But I only brought a little bit of clay with me because. Number one, when you wrap clay up in a plastic bag, it looks a lot like something you're not supposed to bring on an airplane. <laughs> so, so I brought a little bit of clay with me, and I knew I was going to be preaching all over Russia. This is a great story. I think you're going to love this. So I tell the, the, the young man, his name is Alexei. They're at the office in Moscow. I said, Alexei, I only have a little clay. You have to find me some clay. I need some Russian clay. So me and my translator, we went and traveled a couple of times. We ministered, and I was out of clay. So I came back to Moscow, and I said to Alexei at the office, I said, Alexei, have you found me clay? He said, da, I have found you clay. And great. So he hands me this box. I look inside the box, and I, I pull out what looks like a bunch of rocks. I'm like, uh-oh. We have a translation error. I said, clay, he heard rocks. But he insisted, da, it is clay. Glina. It's just their Russian word for clay, it's glina. So, I said, well, there's only one way to know for sure. <laughs> Get me a hammer. So he got me a hammer, I took the hammer and I hit the clay, I hit the rock, which, which was actually was clay. I, I struck it and it actually broke in my hands. And then I struck it again and it broke again. And then I realized that what was disguised as a rock was actually clay. And it was a picture of the Russian nation of the people of Russia. Wow. How they were just, you know, they were, we, we called them the evil empire. They were hard. They were the communists. They were the atheists. And they were hard people. Right. And they were resistant to the gospel. And what happened is this process of the word of God, just like it says yeah. in Ezekiel, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the wow. rock to pieces. Yeah, amen. And so you remember what Jesus said about um, accepting and rejecting the gospel. He says, if you fall upon this rock, you're going to be broken. Mm -hmm. But if the rock falls on you, you're going to be crushed. And that sounds like a really bad thing, but if the crushing brings about a brokenness mm -hmm. that allows the potter to take your heart and take, your, take that hard rock that is your heart and remove it and turn it into a heart of flesh, 
where he can now begin to work with it and change it and transform it. See, I took that, that material that I thought was a rock, <laughs> and the next day, I'm in a church outside of Moscow, I'm making pots with it. I'm showing the people, and then it dawns on me by the power of the Holy Spirit, my gosh, this is a prophetic image of what's going on in, awesome. in the people in the nation of Russia. Awesome. So I, everywhere I travel, all around Russia, even into Siberia, I was able to take that message about how we were once a rock, we were once a rock, and how God, by His Spirit, breaks us by, like His Word, like His Word says, it is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces. He applies His Holy Spirit into our lives, and that hardness that is in our heart melts. Mm -hmm. And what a potter cannot take a hard piece of clay and form it into anything. Mm -hmm. But if he takes a hammer and breaks it, if he takes water and melts it, he can transform it into something, something like this, that in a few minutes can become something like this, wow. that in a few days later can be something like this. This is what we have here at the pottery shop. We have vessels in all different steps and stages of production, and that's what you're here to see. And I'm happy to have my friend Becky join me and share with us the stories. I told you my little story about my encounter there in Russia by the Holy Spirit. Now tell us some of the stories of what God did with you. Okay. Well, after those short-term trips, I went back to my profession okay. in Texas, okay. which was in uh, broadcast media. Okay. And worked a few more years in that field. And my heart was over in Eastern Europe. You really wanted to go back. I really wanted to go back and just continue to pray that God would open a door for me to do that. And in 1996, I completed my education at Christ for the Nations Bible College in Dallas. Okay. And Good school. It's a great school. Yeah. It prepared me to go to the mission field. Um, I had left my career a couple of years earlier, had sold my belongings, given things away, my family was a, a little astonished that I would leave everything to go to the mission field. But I knew God was calling me. And when I got there, I was working with Christ for the Nations in Belarus. It was a new Bible college wow. that had been established after the fall of the Soviet Union, and they needed help. You know, I looked at God and I prayed and I said, Lord, how do you want to use me from a small little cow town? How do you want to use me? Well, probably a lot of people out there listening today that have said the same thing. Exactly. You know, when I'm on mission field, I, I can honestly tell you that there's never a day that goes by where I'm wondering if my life has any meaning or not. And I just know there's a lot of people listening on this, yeah. watching this video. Yeah. And you go through your Christian life and you're going to church, you're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing. And you wonder, does my life really matter? And I can assure you on the mission field... <laughs> You will never have a day go by That's right. where you will wonder if your life matters or not. That's right. Amen. Yeah. So what happened is that God put his word inside of you, and he began to change you. Yeah. And he began to equip you. He, he equipped me, and I didn't even realize how he was equipping me. Okay. I mean, I had a career in media for 10 years before mm -hmm. I went to the field, and he used that. Okay. But then unexpectedly, he used something else. When I was a young... Uh, an early 19, 20, 21 year old person, okay. I was working in my church to do outreach to the poor and the needy okay. through my church. And when I got to the mission field, all around us were the poor and the needy, the widows and the orphans and the veterans. Mm -hmm. And here the Soviet Union had collapsed and all of a sudden people found themselves destitute without anything. Mm -hmm. So God was using these other colleagues of mine in the Bible College and they were called to teach and I could see that we had the orphans and we had the widows and we had the veterans and we had so many people on the streets begging men mm -hmm. drinking away their weekly salaries mm -hmm. on the corners mm -hmm. and it would just bother me so much to walk home and I would see all these groups of men just drinking and drinking and so drunk and, and I would see their wives and their children hurting and struggling. And these women would be sweeping the streets just to earn a little bit to be able to buy food. And it would make me angry. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, Lord, I hate these men 
what they're doing to their families. Yeah. And what he did was he he raised up a desire and a passion to serve those widows and orphans by giving them things. Okay. By giving them clothes and shoes and food. And I would take things from my own suitcases. I would bring mounds and mounds of suitcases mm -hmm. in, in uh, my trips over. And I would find things to give away to these precious children and women. Mm -hmm. And the Lord began to reveal to me that there was a humanitarian aid ministry that he wanted to start through that Bible college. Good. And the directors of that Bible college said, Becky, we're not called to do that. If you're called to do that, you do that. But we're called to teach, and we really need, we really need to take the eyes of the government, who was still a communist government. Mm -hmm. We need to take the eyes of the communist government off of what we are doing with the students. And we need to show them that we are truly serving the community. So if you feel called to do something with humanitarian aid, you do it. And I'd never done anything like that before. <laughs> I'd served in my church. What city in Belarus were you in? We were in the capital city, Minsk. Minsk, okay. I think two or three million people. Big city. Yeah. So we began a process. It was a long process, but I won't go through all those details. Okay. We raised up a humanitarian aid ministry based on Isaiah 58. Okay. And Isaiah 58 says... Um, is this not the fast that I've chosen? Right. To loose the bonds of wickedness? Right. To undo the straps of the yoke? To let the oppressed go free? And to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh. And then he says also, that pure and undefiled religion before the Lord is to minister to the widows right. and the orphans. Right. So here was this darkness that had covered the land for 70 years yeah. of communism. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know these things. So we just brought the scriptures to life to them. We said, this is what you're supposed to do. And God says he will provide seed to the sower and bread for food. So we all need provision. I was a missionary brand new. Mm -hmm. I need a provision too. Just like you've needed provision. Mm -hmm. And so we were trusting God that he would provide seed to the sower and bread for food. And as we laid down the foundations of making sure that first our hearts were right with the scripture. Right. That we, I made disciples. I taught. I, sh I showed them this is what the word says that we are supposed to do. And then God will provide what we need to give. That reminds me of what something Jesus said. He, he said, um, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, yeah. and then these things will be added unto you. Yes. So you were trying to live rightly before the Lord, yes. and then, but then from that came a fulfillment of the needs of the people. See, Jesus didn't say to the people, God doesn't care about the fact that you need clothes. He didn't. No. He never said, God doesn't care about the fact that you, you need food. That's right. You need all those things. Your Heavenly Father is your loving Father. He knows that you need these things. Right. See, when I'm teaching on the potter's wheel, one of the things that always comes out every time I minister is that the clay always has to grow up first before it grows out. Mm -hmm. Seek ye first his kingdom and its righteousness. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second one is like it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, which is what you were doing. From, an op from a position of being rightly related to the Father, you, you were able to then yeah. minister to the needs of the people. Right. And I would probably guess that in the process, they heard and received the gospel. They did. You know, Nolan lives are at stake. And everything that we do in, in the Ministry of International Networks, was, which is my charitable organization, a missionary organization, is we, no matter where we are or what we do, we help people to find eternal life through practical works. And so humanitarian aid was one work mm -hmm. that, that I felt really compelled to help people with. And pretty soon we saw that those things I brought over in my suitcases began to grow. <laughs> And like you said, they grew out 
and now we were receiving containers. Excellent. 40 foot containers filled with tons of things that people gave. Yep. God will use people to give. You know, we pray and we trust God for his provision, but he uses people to give. And we trusted that God would use the people. And so he would raise up a ministry in the United States that wanted to send a cargo container, but they needed somebody faithful on the other side that would right. receive that cargo container and make sure it wouldn't get stuck in customs or stuck in a warehouse right. and distributed wrongly. Right. So part of the other teaching to these... There are some rascals over there. Oh, my we'll goodness. Steal, we'll steal you know, and take that stuff and they will use steal it for it you know, they tried to tell me, Becky, bribery is part of our culture. We must pay a bribe to be able to get these things out of customs and, and to get them out of the warehouse. And I said, no, no, because the Word of God teaches us about bribery right. and that it's not His best. And if we stand on the Word of God, we can trust Him to bless us and He'll make the way for us when we don't even understand how He's making the way for us. Yeah. And they were like, oh my gosh, this woman is driving us crazy. <laughs> and I said, we're not going to pay a bribe. And in all the years that I lived overseas, I never, never one time paid a bribe. You never pay, paid a bribe. Never. That is awesome. And you know what? The, they see that. You're living righteously yeah. and that you can prosper. And that yeah. the Lord himself will say, hey, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're, you're trying to do the right thing. You're standing on my principles. I'm going to make the difference. I'm going to demonstrate my favor. I'm going to move on behalf. There's people that look like they're going to say no. I can deal with that. Oh my gosh, I could tell you story after story <laughs> after story of standing up to these officials, uh -huh. communist officials, and I would look at them and I would shake my finger in their face and I would look at them in the eye and I could feel the anointing of God rise up in me and I would say, we... Americans, we left our families, we left our children, we left our careers, and we came over here to serve your poor and your needy and your orphans and your widows and your veterans, and we are giving all of this for free, and I will not pay your bribe. <laughs> and no one, they would turn on their heels and walk away from me. <laughs> they would be angry. Because they would, like one time, they had my passport. That's a big deal when they've got your passport. Right. And they would throw my passport at me and say, leave now. Whereas they had wanted to detain me. Right. <laughs> so God I raised up. <laughs> I mean. You didn't leave. You stayed. I would walk out of those offices because I didn't right. want to be in those offices. You left their offices, but you didn't leave the city. You didn't no, leave the no, nation. No, no, no. And they were interpreters for me. Mm -hmm. And they would see me do that. And they afterwards, they would look at me and they would say, we don't ever do that. <laughs> That's a miracle that that just happened. Well, it just goes to show. If you're walking rightly before the <laughs> Lord, you're walking in the fear of God, and you know God, you know, think about it. You know, he put the stars in their spots, you know. God will always defend us. He God is will more always than able. More surround than and protect us to take care of us we yeah. don't have to compromise our yeah. principles and that was only one ministry Nolan mm -hmm. after a few years of working with that ministry mm -hmm. um, you know the Bible says we're some we're supposed to make disciples and that means turning over ministries as missionaries mm -hmm. we're to turn those ministries over to our disciples and trust the Holy Spirit right. who work with them to carry on his vision because it's always his vision. It's never my vision. It's never your vision. Are you transitioning into the work you did in Ukraine? The Not build, yet. The building and the construction? Not yet. She's got some marvelous stories of what she's done and helping them learn construction skills, things that, things that weren't even known how to do over there in Eastern Europe. And she was able to take skills, even um, builders and contractors from here in America, yes. bring them to the former Soviet Union and teach them building practices that just was foreign to them. Yeah. Great stories. All right. Becky, show us your book. Thanks. Um, this is my book that I published not too long ago. It's called Piercing the Iron Curtain, My Journeys of Faith. And it's about the first four years, and it contains some of these miracle stories that I just related to you yeah. about our work with humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. Um, about how I learned to live there as a foreigner. Okay. Uh, learning the language, 
funny faux pas that you make <laughs> as a as an American. Yeah, I'm still working on English, so but you're pretty good with Russian right now. Да, я хорошо понимаю и говорю по-русски. Oh, it sounds convincing to me. <laughs> I said I, I pretty well understand Russian. Very good, very good. Russian. My, my problem is I always had I always had very good translators. And um That's so good. It, it's and they liked working as my translator, so as a result of that I I didn't learn a whole lot of Russian. I picked up about twenty or thirty words and that's about it. Okay, now you had a a situation come up when you were in was it Belarus? It was a terrible car accident, wasn't it? It was actually in Poland. It was in Poland. Yeah. We had gone... It was actually in Poland because we had gone to Germany to buy a van okay. for our humanitarian aid ministry. Okay. It had grown so much okay. within a short period of time, and God had revealed that He wanted all that we had in Minsk mm -hmm. in our humanitarian aid center and in these warehouses to go out into the countries. And he established a network of relationships mm -hmm. through the churches and even government organizations that were calling upon us. Our ministry was called From the Heart, okay. And he was, all, people were calling on us saying, we're out here, we need help. We're over here, we need help. So we needed a van. And to buy a van within the country of Belarus was very precarious and risky because they have chop shops everywhere. Mm -hmm. They take pieces and parts and you never know what you're going to get. Right. So I knew of a place that we could go buy a van in Germany and drive it over to Belarus. And in the process of driving that van in February back to Belarus, we had a terrible crash. Oh no. I was not driving. We had a driver that had been sent to us by another minister and he was going around a truck on black ice in the night. It was passing on black ice at night. Yeah, yeah. Flipped the van <laughs> over, we wrapped around a tree, and in that process I broke my neck and my back. Oh my gosh. Miracle stories in about Poland. that. That's in Poland. In Poland? That story's in this book. I can't even tell you all the details or we'd be here like for two days. Yeah. It's a miracle how I ever even got out of that van alive. Yeah. I walked out of that van. I walked broke, out. Were they broken neck I had and a broken, broken back? And a broken back. Of course, I didn't know it. And, um, you know, being in a Polish hospital was scary. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was there with my interpreter, and she had been injured as well. Not as bad. Her driver was also injured, but he basically walked away. And um, I was in Polish hospital for a, a little over... 10 days while they fashioned a brace for me that came up underneath my chin, around the back of my neck, whole body brace, so that I couldn't twist or turn or move. Right. They wanted to put me in a body cast. But actually, before that, they wanted to do operation. We must do operation on you. I was like, no, no, because I'd been in the Soviet hospitals, post-Soviet mm -hmm. hospitals, yes. and I did not want them touching me, yeah. knowing what I knew from our humanitarian aid work. And so they were able to fashion a brace for me. We were able to work through the American Embassy. I love the American Embassy people. <laughs> they are angels. Good. They came to help me. We worked with people back home, found an emergency flight for me. Okay. Um, got me back to the United States, got me back to Texas. All the details are in this book. Can't tell you all the details. Amazing. Within three months, without surgery, Without any major medicine that I could get hooked on, God had healed me Praise in answer God. to my Hallelujah. prayers. And I returned to the mission field completely whole, ready to carry on. And I knew, Nolan, I knew that in that dark night, the enemy had tried to kill me. He had tried to squash my pot, to take away my destiny. Wow. And I knew that I had to fight. Spiritual warfare is real. And in that night, he was trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And I thank God for friends around the world that prayed me through that situation. That's an amazing story, Becky. And um, it reminds me of the scripture I use a lot when I'm ministering. It is 2 Corinthians 4, 7. And this is Paul speaking. 
He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And if you can imagine, you know, when a potter reads this scripture, we realize Paul is describing himself as a work in progress. He's describing the treasure, Christ in him, Christ in me, Christ in you. He's just describing Christ in us, the hope of glory. So says that is the treasure that we have, in not, a, not in finished vessels, but actually in jars of clay, in order to demonstrate and to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. I mean, we all have a potter working in our lives. It's our Heavenly Father. Amen? And the treasure, Jesus, when you ask Christ to come inside of you, that deposit of Holy Spirit that's been deposited inside of you, that is a treasure. And, the, and from the outside of this piece of clay, there's a lot of things that can happen that can go wrong. Difficulties, temptations. While you're trying to do the will of God, you get in a terrible car accident, and you break your neck and you break your back. What must that have felt like? Oh, well, first of all, it was very painful. Very painful? Very painful. Did you ever have any moments where you're like, God, I did. I'm just trying to help these people, and why did you allow this to happen? I mean, good things happen to bad things happen to good people. And yeah. didn't make any sense at the moment, did it? It didn't. My first opportunity to speak out faith mm -hmm. was on the airplane home Okay. with that broken neck and back. But you were on a stretcher above the seats, weren't you? I was on a stretcher. Oh, and, my gosh. And, you know, that's a long flight over the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And it never gets any shorter. <laughs> I keep thinking they need to fill it in a little and, bit. And, <laughs> you know, it doesn't It doesn't matter. Even if you don't drink water, you still got to go to the bathroom. Oh, my gosh. So At 36,000 feet. Yeah. So um, with a broken neck and a broken back. Yeah, strength. I was in a brace, oh, so I could I could at least use my legs. I could walk. Thank the Lord, I was not paralyzed. So uh, another missionary friend who was accompanying me. Okay. She had some experience. Speaking of things that we have experience for, mm -hmm. she had been a candy stripe nurse years ago. Okay. And so she knew how to handle patients with neck and back injuries. And she instructed the flight attendants where to position themselves. And she said, I'm going to count to three. And on three, we're all going to work together. And we're going to lift her up and out and pop her up. <laughs> so here we are. You know, all these people are watching. And she says, one, She's two, gone. three. And all of a sudden, I'm up, I'm out, and I'm on my feet. <laughs> and all these people are looking down the aisle at me like, wow, what a show. Courage. Oh, my goodness. It and was, you weren't screaming your lungs out. I, I wasn't. Thank God. I, the pain wasn't that bad at okay. that point. I didn't realize that they had given me some heavy-duty drugs at the hospital. Okay. <laughs> so I was right. a little bit high. But okay. anyway, um, we were able to work through and negotiate that situation. Into the bathroom. Into the bathroom, got that taken. You know, God helps us in every situation. He is so intimately involved with our lives. And there's there's purpose to it. Yes. There's a point to it all. Now, we don't understand it all the time when we're going through the very, very difficult time. I mean, when Paul's being shipwrecked or when he's being stoned, I mean, it looks really terrible. Let me finish the scripture yeah. I started a moment ago. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, That's right. struck down, but not destroyed. Mm -hmm. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. What you've watched here while we're talking, I'm producing this vessel, it's almost done. What you have witnessed is a picture of what Jesus talked about when he said, if anyone should come after me, he's got to deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Now, to the, the people out in the world, that sounds like crazy talk. But to us who have embraced the kingdom, who have embraced the, the Spirit of God and, and surrendered our lives to God, we understand that we die to ourselves so that something eternal can be brought forth in our lives. This piece of clay, over and over and over again, had to die to itself to become what you see here. 
And that's what Paul's describing. He's describing himself as a work in progress so that the life of Jesus will be revealed in our bodies. Beloved, I understand difficulties, I understand temptations, I understand despair, and I understand that in that midst of that time, that process, you don't really understand, well, God, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. But just like this piece of clay, it had to experience a systematic dying to itself. Remember, it looked just like this at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It looked just like that. It had to die to itself when it came out of the ground. It had to die to itself every time the potter touched the clay to become what you see here today, a little water pitcher. Now, when this piece of clay was in the earth, you would not have paid a nickel for it. But I can assure you by the time this is finished and fired and glazed and fired again, when it's in a gallery, it's going to be worth at least $100. How can that happen to a piece of material that you wouldn't pay a nickel for? It happens because it's changed. And that's a picture of what God desires for all of our lives. He says, it doesn't matter what ditch you came out of. It doesn't matter what hole in the ground you came out of. It doesn't matter if you were drug out of the bottom of a pond. It doesn't matter what life was like in the clay pit that was your life before you came to know the Lord. What is important is you are now with his hands. And if, that's, if I'm describing you, you're just a lump of clay. You look at your life and it's just mesh and mush and... Every time you try to elevate yourself and make your life better, it just gets worse. That's just a, that's a testimony of clay in the bottom of a ditch. It's just being moved from one low place to another every time the rains come. And God says, I got a better plan for your life. Just like this piece of clay, it came out of a hole in the ground. It came out of a ditch. If you will surrender your life to Christ, and God, he will, he will take you out of that miserable situation that you're stuck in. And he will bring you new life. He will forgive you of your sins. Because I assure you, this piece of clay experienced a lot of bad stuff when it was in the ditch. But you know what? Here's the good news. It's not in the ditch anymore. <laughs> and that can be your testimony. You can come out of the ditch. You can come into the plans and the purposes of God. It says here in the Ephesians that God, before the foundations of the earth, before the beginning of creation, he had a plan for your life. That's great news. Give that plan a shot. He loves you. He paid the price for your sins. He'll wash you no matter what you did in that clay pit. He'll take you into his hands. He'll transform your life. And I assure you, when he's done with you, it'll be beautiful. It'll be functional. And just like these finished vessels you see over here, it will be eternal. It'll last forever. Let me read one more scripture out of 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a, a glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. See, so this is a picture of what's happening inside of you. This is a picture of what's happening inside of you. When God changes you and transforms you from the inside out. Though outwardly, our flesh is wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Trust in the potter. Ask the Father, Lord God, if that potter can take a piece of clay and turn it into something beautiful, and your word says you will do that in my life. Lord, do that in my life. I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And take my life like a lump of clay. Put your hands together and say, God, this, this represents my life, this piece of clay. Surrender to the Lord. And say, Father, change me like, you, like this potter changed this piece of clay. Forgive me of my sins and give me new life. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Thank you for watching Jeremiah 18. This interview will be continued on our next program. We here at Jeremiah 18 appreciate your prayers and your financial gifts as they allow us to continue to produce the show. I'm your host, Nolan Minolz.